You, you passed on the five-year extension. What can you tell us about where the lease stands now? Yeah, um, the, the statement that Governor Moore and I put out jointly on the same day that the governor uh, did his um, State of the State address, um, I think speaks volumes. I have no doubt that we will uh, but relatively rapidly move towards the uh, renewal of the public-private partnership full net. And uh, I'd be very disappointed um, if I'm not able to do it on board that the governor and his team, who, as you know, he just appointed people on Friday, new, new board members, uh, a new chairman, um, to make that happen in the next uh, six months sooner. And I'd love to have that as an all-star break gift for uh, everybody, really, in the community. There's just there's just no there there other than we're going to get that done. And that's always been one of the things I committed to. Um, and I'll, you know, I have no intention of not seeing that happen. Um, I know the governor and his folks are are just as keen on it as we are. Do you have a previous relationship with the uh, the new chairman? Yeah, I know you had a relationship with Kelso, but did you have the previous relationship with, with Craig? Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't. I just, I'm just getting to know Craig, and um, you know, he's he's got a really impressive background. Um, we have spoken once, um, but that's about it. And they're looking forward to working together. How comforting is it to have your family's legal situation resolved? Uh, I think those things are distractions, and it's unfortunate whenever they arise. Um, but all good things going forward now, and um, I'm really confident what Mike and Brandon are doing, what the management team's doing, and I think those things are uh, as they should be in the in the rearview mirror and proceeding. How long is Mike under contract here? So I think you guys have asked Mike that a couple times, I, 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 and, and he is, I think, de declined to say, you know, this is the entertainment, the community activity, it's sports, it's media, it's supposed to be fun and a distraction. You, you, a lot of companies don't talk about their human resources issues and their employment contracts. I, I will tell you guys this. Um, I'm here for the long haul. Mike is here for the long haul. Brandon's here for the long haul. We are all um, fully vested. Uh, we're not going anywhere. And nobody's a short timer. Nobody is expiring in a year or two years or anything like that. I, I hope you guys respect it. It's just not great policy for me to talk about people's personal relationships. But we're all here under contract long term. John, what what is the reason that Goulos agreement has taken so has taken this long? Well, you know, first of all, if you if you back up a little bit from it and think about a, it is a I would just suggest that we think about it as a community development of an economic potential, a public private partnership. That's what it really is. A, a lease, right, is a very narrow part of that public-private partnership. You, you, you've got the public part where the state and the locality invest pro, uh, public dollars. You've got the Orioles investing private dollars. You hopefully will have a commercial real estate development on Camden Yards as the, the outgoing uh, uh, chairman, Tom Kelso, has talked about publicly and testified. Live, work, play, 365. That's going to be a huge step forward for the next iteration of Camden Yards. So the, all of that is part of it. The actual facility use agreement, renewing a 30-year-old document, is um, kind of, that, that, that's really a minor sidelight. So I think, if to the extent it's taken long, and I, I, I don't think it's taken long. I mean, I think, I think it's been a great 30 years where we've driven 75 million people and the Ravens have generated another 20 million. When you get 100 million visitors out of a 30-year relationship, well, I don't know if that's taken too long. I think you should be deliberate and thoughtful. And quite frankly, I, I, you know, we had an outgoing administration with great Governor Hogan and all of his people. But you had an incoming governor-elect. And um, I loved working with Governor Hogan and Tom Kelso. But, you know, I'm really looking forward to working with the next administration, with Governor Moore. And um, I wanted to uh, interface fully with the new governor, with his administration with his new chairman, hit the new board that's being appointed. As you guys know, the board's being expanded. So now the Senate president has an appointee, Speaker of the House has an appointee, the governor, uh, uh, Mayor Scott has an appointee. Uh, it, but we should do that transparently. We should do that communicatively. I, I didn't think it would be right to rush something through in the final days uh, of, of the Hogan administration. John, when Mike mentioned liftoff, 
and he was talking about the team being made out of content. And some people interpret that as also payroll, which he explained later. And I, is there anything you're able to, to share about the budget itself, the comfort zone, when you, it might be more lift off for that area? Yeah, I, I, I would say this, you know, it, I, we committed, as you guys know, in 2018, 19 to a full rebuild, you know, no, and I have a foot in every can, but, um, take the best baseball advice. Um, and, and, and we committed to that and we've done it, right? We've, um, I don't think we're rebuilding anymore to, to Mike's thought. Um, I'm glad we were in a full rebuild because it was what was recommended and was the right thing. Um, it was also, we were fortunate that as the world hit a pandemic, we were uh, stripped down to that full. I mean, that was just good luck, really. I mean, in that sense that to not have a lot of payroll out there, teams that had a lot of payroll and that were relying on live attendance to pay for that were in a much worse situation. We did, we were much better situated, just luck, lucky really. Um, so was the intention to not invest during the rebuild? No, um, we continued to invest. As you guys know, we didn't spend much money on international free agents and we spent the maximum every year of the rebuild. We're gonna keep doing that. If, I, if we could spend more, we would. It's capped by the league rules. Um, We've obviously invested and signed, not only drafted, but signed all or substantially all, excuse me, of our players um, on the in the domestic draft, which is what we ought to be doing. We've invested in facilities in the Dominican and here. I anticipate we're going to invest more this year, next year. And if you see all the technology here that I don't begin to understand, but that these guys say is a, an important part of it. And um, we've invested in that. We're just laying in foundational dollars for all of those things, international, domestic, technology, facilities. Th this facility is going to be invested in. The minor league, we're thinking about some interesting things to renew this facility, uh, the stadium, but really this area, which is the R&D function of the team. So that's never ending. Now, payroll, um, I think there's, a, there's a, a range there that Mike and his team have to determine and you know, yeah, but do I have a role in that? Yeah. Really only to make sure that their recommendations are being properly funded. We're probably not going to have, nor is any other middle or small market team, the payroll of the Mets or the Dodgers or the, even the Red Sox or certainly the Yankees. But that doesn't, that's not an Oriole thing. That's a small and middle market team in this economic system. This is not football. This is not basketball. Um, um, in a lot of respects, it'd be great if it were. I think, you know, you see in those other leagues where Oklahoma City can spend at the same level uh, as the New York Knicks in Madison, playing in Madison Square Park. We're not there yet in baseball, but we're going to make all these capital investments and, and stay the course, and um, we'll see where the payroll goes. I mean, you guys know the numbers better than I do. But you've got examples like Tampa. You've got examples like Cleveland. You've got examples like Milwaukee, and they're all different payroll levels. That... That's for others to, to determine. If you're asking me if we have the resources, we absolutely have the resources. And we plan to keep moving the payroll up. But we kind of keep making these long-term capital investments. We do think they're working. We do think the full rebuild was was the right thing and is working. And we're going to keep investing in that R&D. So we, we, we're not only where we are today, but over the next five or eight years, we uh, can keep this going. And I think we can keep it going. Not just a five-year cycle, hopefully a self-sustaining, more than five-year, five, eight, ten-year. That's the goal. And I think with the people we've recruited and brought in um, on the baseball in the group and in the business group, that's another thing. We're going to, we have a very small staff. We're going to keep building that. We just, you guys know, we would, I recruited Cal Perry to join on and does the content officer. Most teams don't have that. That's an investment too in bright people. So, um, you know, more good times ahead and definitely more best. John, when you, when you say that you know, Brandon, here, Brandon is here for the long term, Mike, and you, does that mean that the team was going to stay in Angelo's family hands? That it's not. Yeah, no, that's a that good question. So, so there is absolutely no plan to change the partnership group or to change the managing partnership structure that we have um, to the extent that other people would say, hey, I 
I like what they're doing in Baltimore. I like that Camden Yards is going to be part of a renewed public-private partnership with the city and the state, and I want to be part of that. Well, sure. I mean, why, why would... That's all of the partners that um, my family, my father put together 30 years ago. M many, not all. Some have transitioned out. But it's been a tremendous amount of continuity. But you want to have a next generation of people coming in, too. And you want them to be excited. And it would be nice if we could attract strategic people um, who care about Baltimore, who care about the way we're doing this now, who care about the example Camden Yard set, and, and want to be part of it. That's not necessary or require or requisite, but it's we're open to it. But there is no plan to change or uh, to transition out of what we have today. John, so to follow, to follow up on that real quick, so does that mean that if you do you know, bring some more people in. I mean, you obviously have enough of your family has enough of the resources to sell 20% and still be you know, the majority owner. Is majority owner the thing that, that you guys are, are I guess, most uh, focused on? I mean, obviously, if you sell some people out, you will still, the Angelo's family will still be the majority. Well, well, first of all, let me say, everybody that's in is welcome to stay in for another 30 years, right? And we, and that, I think we're proud of that, that we've had continuity. We, we've had partners like Pam Schreiber, like Barry Levinson, um, and others that are not as well known as those, the Clancy family, um, who have been part of this from the beginning and are still part. And um, it, my only comment about that is certainly if somebody approached, uh, just like one of, a media publication that you guys are part of, if somebody came in and said, I really like what you're doing and I want to be part of that, particularly if you had a synergy, if they were involved in, say, media or entertainment or music, um, uh, or real estate development, we, you name it. Why, why wouldn't you have that conversation? But to answer, you know, your question, Dan. Yeah, I we I wouldn't say we're focused on any one thing, but I would say there's not a plan to change the principal ownership or the managing partnership structure that we have, and there'd really be no reason to that I can think of. And um, I wouldn't want to do that. I think we want to see this through, um, take this public-private partnership to a whole other place. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's what we owe to the people that created Camden Yards. I mean, we didn't create it. I hope we've been good stewards of the facility. I think what we've done here, where we took a pulp, where the Reds were here, as you guys know, the city owned part of it, the county, everybody who was sort of, a, they, they, we privatized that, we, we develop it all, we, if, we, if there's development, we uh, manage it, we do all the maintenance, all the operations here, and 14 to 13 years later, not a not a blip. Great relationship. I'll, I get together with the commissioners that I worked with 12 years ago. I get together with the county administrator, um, and we've generated. You guys see the press releases. I'll you know know how much time you spend on those, but it, you know it's a little bit more dry than all this. But you know, we're proud of that. We're proud of that hundred million, ninety four million dollars a year that the state and the city and the county and the Orioles say we generated. When I testified 10, 12 years ago, I said we thought we generate 38 or 40 million dollars so we under promised and we over delivered we've done that in baltimore and i i know that we're going to do it again in the next whatever camden yards 2.0 with live work play so i want to be around for that and i want to make sure that the you know having spent a lot of time institutionally around this um i think that's my job um my job's not here this other people do this my job is to how do we make that 365 live, work, play? How do we make this thing a catalyst for speaking as aspirationally about what Baltimore and Maryland and this Orioles, Ravens, city and state partnership can be? We, we can go a whole another paradigm shift. And I, and I think we're going to. And um, I'm not critical to it. You know, we're all, indisp we're all dispensable. But... Um, I, I think I can play an important role in it and try to be, try to move it forward faster um, and hopefully effectively. When we spoke to you last month, you offered to bring us back to the warehouse, show us the financials, show us the government's. Do you expect that meeting See, to take I, place? Well, I knew we'd be here in Florida, so I had, there's no warehouse to take you to. Um, but, you know, obviously, let me say something about that. That's an old idea. First, first of all, it was, been, it was talked about, you guys who are students of the uh, 94 strike, one of the things that re recurringly came up was, what is the industry crop in the aggregate? What individual teams crop it? Big market, small market. How do we solve this question of how is revenue being shared? 
and profitability being shared between labor and management, let's call them, right? My father at the time called on baseball to, under Commissioner Selig, to open the books, so to speak. In a lot of ways, what I was saying in response to Dan that day was, I was, re- I was going back to that time. I, I think there should be so much more trust, and I may be the only one, I may be naive in saying this, but you know, there should be more trust between Players Association and, in, and teams and the league. Now, why? Because I say, no, because that's how you're going to grow the pie. Baseball's 10, 11, 12 billion dollars, let's say. How's that going to be 15, 18, 20? How's that going to equal or eclipse the NFL if that's a reasonable goal? I don't know if it is or is. Well, it's going to be through partnership. It's not going to be through distrust. And so when I say, let's open the books, and I would share with you guys an overview, which, which I intend, intend to do. And I, I intend to do that while we're here in spring training. I am going to do what I said I would do within our conversation. I'm going to sit down with you and all of you. And I'm good. Can I show you uh, every, to your question earlier or someone's question, can I show you the date that Mike Elias's contract expired? I, I mean, no, but, you know, your editors and your publisher and your executives don't do that with your employment contracts either. That's just a standard that isn't applicable in any, excuse me, any business. And I can't be held to that state. I can't, but I can hold myself to a much higher standard than I think we have in the past. And I think what you're asking, what you would like to have. And I was reminded that uh, they cut the hedges down here and it's a lot more transparent. Michael Elias told me, he told you. Uh, yeah, it's great. You can see right across the whole place. I, I'm not going to be able to pull out the payrolls and show you everything financially, but I can give you a full picture for the business. I can give you certainly a picture for what our objectives are on the field. But really, I want you to understand at least my view, whether you agree with it or not, on the context of our vision off the field and in the community. It, it, I think if you don't have to have that part of it, you're, you're missing a, a, a huge, you're not gonna understand where I'm coming from or where the organization's trying to go. And I want you to understand that. So if it means sitting down and putting up on a whiteboard, this is the club. This is, you know, this is how it all fits together and where we're trying to go, I'll do that. Um, so more to follow on that. Before spring training's over, I will sit down with you guys, as I said. I did. And I, I would just say this, you know, I, I said we were going to rebuild the team and we do it a certain way. And, and Mike and Brandon, and they've done that. I mean, there's no question they've done that, right? I mean, we went from bottom of the league to top on R&D, on, on talent in the minor leagues. We obviously had a 31-game turnaround. Now, we all know this year, could, who knows what will happen this year, and that's fine. But we've done what we've done. I said we would bring in major music concerts. And, 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 and I did that. We did that. And, and you know, when you think about it, in 19 months, if you take away COVID, we've announced three, someone, uh, TJ Brightman told me, that he said it's the Mount Rushmore of music, right? Uh, oh, the, 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 the boss and, and Paul McCartney and Billy Joel, right? Well, that's delivering on what we said we would do. There were no concerts at Camden Yards for 25 or 30 years. For whatever reason, water over the dam we said there would be and now they're off and i and when i say something like well i'm going to sit down with you guys and explain the business from my perspective um i'm going to do it i'm not going to say it and walk away from it i couldn't do it the next day i couldn't you know but here we are uh and maybe we'll just substitute that building for the warehouse so more to come on um to follow up to your point about payroll the three teams you mentioned milwaukee keith and tampa right. historically have bottom half of the week payrolls they haven't won a world series at least not in recent years what does that say about what you guys are aiming for if those are the models you're looking at well we're aiming for sustained success and i think what you see in a place like tampa they have had sustained success it's a great testament to uh Stuart sternberg's leadership his partnership group um and and he's had different presidents of baseball ops different gms over time and they've stayed relevant and important and competitive in a very difficult environment. Um, um, obviously, with a new ballpark, it would seem that they'd only do better, and probably their payrolls go up. Um, but I, I am encouraged that he's that Tampa's done what they've done. That's a great thing to aspire to. There is no reason why I would again be, much like I said, with the public-private partnership, I would be disappointed if we're not the next Tampa, right? Which means being 
sustainably competitive and relevant. Um, we got a great, we got a, we're fortunate to have a, a great venue. Right now, they don't have that. Hopefully, they will. Um, but I'd like to be thought of as as uh, competent and uh, capable and professional, as I think all of us view a, an organization like Tampa. I mean, that that's an aspiration. I I think we're going to get there. So, to be clear, you ex- you expect payroll to also model Tampa in a lot of ways. No, I didn't say that. I I don't expect payroll to model any particular team. I was giving you guys a range, excuse me, of small and middle market teams. Mm-hmm. Right. So could payroll be uh, double or triple what it is? Or could it be over a hundred million or yeah, I mean that we're not there yet. Mm. We have a very young team that's overachieved and overperformed because of the great work of our baseball folks. Um it's not my it's not my job to predict payroll. My job is to make sure that the community partnerships are sustained. And I think all of it comes after that, right? First I have to do the concerts, then we have to do the PPP. We got the legislation passed initially, but there's more to do there. And we've got to perform as these guys are performing on the field, the, the, meaning Brandon and Mike and the two and the players. Um, but that's, it's not for me to sit back and project uh, payroll. I know that you guys do, and you want me to ask, but you're asking me to look three, four, five years ahead. I, all those scenarios are possible. I, I'm simply using Milwaukee as a good example of a market that's similar to Baltimore in the shadow of a much bigger market, Chicago versus DC. And I'm saying you certainly could see successful, Milwaukee's been successful, good partner owners there, um, good baseball people there. And they've been at a certain payroll. Cleveland and Tampa have been lesser. That doesn't mean you can't be higher. Does that answer the question? Because I'm definitely not saying it must be lower than something arbitrary. Can you, John, when you get created mass and uh, we were told that a regional store or something like that would put you guys in a payroll area with Yankees, Red Sox, whomever. Um, and, and now it's been in all these years. Obviously, Masson has changed. Regional sports networks have changed. Yeah. You're going a lot to streaming and everything else. Um, what is the status of Masson now? Not just on the March 14th uh, hearing, but just where do you see Masson? I mean, it's a situation that you guys are doing fewer games here than I think any other team in Major League Baseball from Cumber Spring Trainings. So what is the status of Masson? Yeah, you know, spring training. Let me take the last part of that first. Spring training games are often talked about, and I. And you're right. There are networks that do greater numbers than we do. And the Red Sox doing 27. They're doing some, yeah, and they're doing some digital, and they're doing some uh, linear and digital. And the, the Red Sox are also the only RSN out there right now. I think to to speak of, I mean, there might be one or two others that are doing a direct to consumer product in an attempt to try to figure out, which they haven't. None of us have. The big media companies haven't figured out yet. Unbundling, cord cutting, cord nevers, and does direct to consumer work. Or the the leads, the NBA, the NHL, and MLB are trying to figure that out. Obviously, with what's happened with Sinclair recently, or what's happening right, with Diamond Sports Group. Um, spring training games. It was. It is. It is a. It is a business decision, a judgment call. Doesn't mean, by the way, that I know the way we do it today is right. You you make a great point. The Nesson, Nesson does more, right? Um, spring training games are relatively low-rated games, right? They're very low-rated games. They're, most of them are in the afternoons on weekdays. Um, the only professional sport that's really still doing anything on afternoons and weekdays is probably horse racing, right? So, I mean, it, it's a tough putt. That doesn't mean you should or shouldn't do it, but it's hard to make it pay. Now, the counter-argument is just spend it as a cost of doing business, right? And... It'll help promote the teams. It'll help promote the game. But that's an entirely reasonable argument. We have historically made the decision to focus on fewer games in the spring and pour more of our production into the course of the season. Um, uh, the, the industry is definitely in, uh, you know, it, it's in, it's got, it has headwinds. It's continued to evolve. And um, you're seeing the biggest media companies in the, in the world right now, much bigger than sports bigger than all the leagues right they're they're doing uh new things they're 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 shoring up their situation i mean when you see disney's and hbo's and other people laying people off excuse me again and all of that that's a that's a means a bigger world outside of us that we don't control we we will i hope do more games we certainly when you have two baseball teams i mean right there you do over 300 live events and we do 600 
live pre and post game shows. That's at or near the first or second or third RSN in the country and has been for 15 years. I mean, nobody, except for maybe I think it was Fox Sports South, maybe a couple others, did more, does more live events than we do. Should that come at the expense of spring training? And I, as I said, I don't know. I think it's a valid, certainly a valid question and criticism. Um, let me say something about Masson, though. Masson was created in 1997, okay, and it was created as an entity to do what later, what actually what the Red Sox had done in the 80s. They were ahead of everybody with Nesson. Then the Yankees did in the early 2000s, and we did the year after the Yankees did it with Yes. That's what Masson was first created for. But the compensation that was provided for, which is the issue on March 15th, the compensation agreement in 2005 between Major League Baseball and the Orioles, what that agreement did was it channeled permanent compensation to the public-private partnership between Baltimore, City of Baltimore, State of Maryland, and the Orioles through the Masson vehicle. That wasn't the only way to do it. That was the way it was chosen by the parties to do it. So Masson already was a thing that, that owned the rights. When Commissioner, former Commissioner Seelig decided to move the Expos to DC, which if you guys remember, they bought the Expos, they resold the Expos uh, to, the, in that case, the Learners, and they put the team 38 miles away from Camden Yards. The league agreed with the Orioles and the state of Maryland that we needed a compensation vehicle. And it was said by putting both teams' rights in that vehicle that already existed from 1997. Obviously, the team moved in 2000. The Expos moved in 05. So eight years later, we created the vehicle for the permanent compensation that the Orioles and the state and the city lost when Commissioner Seelig moved the Expos to D.C. That's what, that's what the, 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 the resolution of the compensation, which I think is eminently solvable, and with Masson, without Masson, however you do it, revenue sharing, you know, whatever the, the form of that, all we need to be sure of, if you're, if you're Brandon Scott or Wes Moore, or, or in my position, you have the same goal. Make sure that there is the same permanent long-term compensation to the Orioles, the Orioles are the only team that has a bilateral settlement agreement with Major League Baseball. Only team. Probably the only team in sports that has that. And they're the, because they're the only team that had a team put by the last commissioner 38 miles away. That's why we have it. And that's why the compensation was agreed to. Preserving the compensation is existential to the city, the state, and the Orioles. And I think it's existential to Major League Baseball. I mean... As Rob Manfred has said, and, and he and I have a really good relationship, the Orioles will always be in Baltimore. He's right. I agree with him. I said it before he did, but we, we that's because we've talked about it together. It's, the Orioles are always going to be in Baltimore. But these mechanisms that balance the ability of franchises to compete, and we are in a category of one. We're the only ones to have had that happen. Rob inherited that. I inherited that. Okay, let's just preserve the vehicles that we have and... This franchise will hopefully be doing what it did last year and better for many years to come. And that, that's my only goal. And my job's done. I a few more, check a few more boxes, and, and that's it. We renew the public-private partnership. And, um, um, yeah, you know, that's that's it. There's something more to do at that point. And after that hearing for the next month or two? Oh, I'll I, I, like about that. I, yeah, I mean, this thing's been going on. As I said, you know, Commissioner Manfred and I inherited it. Um, it was something that was carved out in the late 90s, early 2000s, because that's uh, the, you were around covering it when the dialogue was going on about baseball, D.C., what to do with expansion teams. It's just that it was a much broader issue that um, it's been going on for 15 years. The litigation for a lesser part of that, but a, a long time, I think it's resolvable today, tomorrow, over simplifying with separate and apart from that, from that appellate track. Wait, and that's that's litigation and on top. If my goal, I'd be totally surprised to hear just to never be around any litigation again. I, you don't need litigation to solve problems. You just need good partners, and we could we could sort sort that out and solve it very quickly. With before that, after that, to your point, yeah, I think that's an old toss. A toss. With it, Fox NBC, 
the state gave you access to 600 billion public funds. Bob just mentioned revitalization, probably with Houston, any specific somewhat you got to have a plan of that. So, and I drive the staff crazy about this. So this is with all, with the, with a, I, the way I think of it for what it's worth, with the, with the reformulation and renewal of the public private partnership, a sub part, which may be four, one of four or five pillars of which is the, what I would call the facility use agreement for the least, all the least guys. All that with what the Ravens and the Stadium Authority did recently, that's really just who manages the facility, where people paw, it gets a lot of nuts and bolts and sort of did. That's just a piece. The bigger question is how does the transportation work? How does the crime and security mechanisms work? Smart city and technology, co-tourism. We, ha- we are able to promote the state of Maryland and the city throughout the mid-Atlantic. We, we want it to die. That's what's in this agreement. For, for a dozen more or more years, we've been promoting visitor, visitorship to, to, well, we should be doing that for Baltimore. Yeah, and then the facility use agreement or the lease is a fra- is a part of that. I, I lost that question and then tried it. Just what specifically do you have taken in for the 600 million? Oh, well, nothing now. I mean, I, I, I think there nothing's, well, let me step back. Those numbers were arrived at through a relatively, um, early and somewhat uh, overview, a survey by the stadium authority, the oils and the rates. What does it feel like? What is the amount of money that each stadium or ballpark needs to be brought back up to standard? Um, I think there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes, boilers and air conditioning and all kinds of stuff that none of us will ever, well, maybe some of us will see, but nobody else, none of the fans will, and they won't see it when it's when it's old and they won't see it when it's replaced it's just table stakes you've got to put 100 150 whatever it is 200 million into the ravens and orioles plant physical plant to make it work um what what do you do with the rest i mean the things you see around the league amenities uh improved seating areas um possibly injection into the, the, the work play but it's probably needed for the two venues audio video systems you've had two scoreboards two audio visual systems in the history of camden yards the first one was done in 92 or 91 when the stadium was open it wasn't actually probably bleeding yet te- technology with from what the experts say then and then it was replaced in uh 08 or 09 or yeah, yeah. um less that that's 15 years ago so that so th- now those kinds of things really aren't capital improvements they're really just O and M, or or their capital replenishments to bring things back up to standard. But that scoreboard is a dozen years old. It's got to be replaced. It's not really an option. I mean, I'd like to actually say, "Hey, I leave it the way it is," right? But eventually, you just lose the technology burns out, the parts go away, and you have to do these. Things. So there'll be things like that, on, and then there will be kind of nice to haves that are also contemplated in, say. X hundred million dollars of that. Um, but no, I, we're not down to that specific level. It was a needs analysis just as to the two facilities. Doesn't address, hey, what can we do for the Livewood play on the 35 or 40 acres of asphalt um, with or without replacement of part being in all those details. That's going to take, that's going to take, uh, I don't think it takes time. I think it de- takes an umbrella memorandum of understanding that I still think can be, I do think, I, I can be signed in the period I, I mentioned. And it lays out a roadmap to renovate each ballpark and then do the uh, 365 live work play development, which will obviously take several years to do, many years to do. Um, but, you, but you create the framework and then you have a rules of the road and you move forward with what others have accomplished in Atlanta, a little bit in Detroit, whatever they're trying to do in Texas with the Cowboys, et cetera. But I think Atlanta is the best uh, example of what's possible if you can do it. And I think that's what we, we all aspire to do. I think the state does. I know the mayor does. Could really make a statement for why Baltimore is back and um, why it's going to be a big part of the future of, of the country and thought of in a, as a can-do way instead of in a, some of the ways it's been thought of through packets. One of the renovations that was made through you is the left field ball and, and pushing it back. 
what was the sales pitch to you on that and how leery were you on going ahead and changing what this had become an iconic ball call? Yeah. Um, if, you know, it's, I, they, well, I don't know how, I'll say it this. They, they, I don't, I didn't put the management team together. I'm not going to add to the management team with a, with, a, with a thought that I know best and you have to sell me on side, right? I mean, it really is their department. Now, yes, um, there are all kinds of considerations. The iconic nature of the ballpark, the aesthetics. Um, get enough people in a room, I'm sure we all have a different opinion on that, right? But I really felt like that was based on the belief by the baseball folks that it would help us with our long-term additiveness and relevance. And that's really, unless I thought that was um, per se or invalid, which I did, I really didn't require me to do much of any. And I, they, they said it was going to work. Um, it, there's a, there's a, a presumption by me that they're uh, smart, bright, reasonable people who want to win. And why would they want to do it? Um, I thought it was um, just something that you, uh, the company, just pre-authorized and would go with, you know. And also, you know, Dan, let's say it didn't work out. Let's say in any number of ways, sometimes the best laid plans, well, then you'd have to change it. And um, that'd be unfortunate because X million, but you can't be afraid to let your your best people make decisions in the, in the field. Um, so I would, you know, I was aware of it, um, but I wasn't an activist you know, kind of in trying to figure it out for myself. That, that's, they're figuring it out. And, and um, you know, it, it has made an impact, um, you know. Uh, and I think that's how we, how we roll. That's how we operate. You know, I'm not, here to, I'm not here to pass on anything going on here any more than maybe you. Well, you guys actually are more standing more judgment than I do in some ways. Yeah, I'm heavily invested. And I want it to turn out well. And then I, I tell you the truth, I'm more like if I see a rusted out trash can, I want to make sure we throw it away, you know. And if I'm into that, we're in trouble, you know. I, I rely on them, and I think they're doing a great job so far. That's it. Thank you, John. Okay. And Chuck, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right.